Hi, I'm Gary Knoll, and I'd like to welcome you to a continuation of a long-going series over 40 years discussing self-empowerment issues. Today the issue is how to unclutter your life. We're down in Texas, Northeast Texas. We're a group of individuals participating in an anti-aging clinical study. And you would think that if you're going to do anti-aging, the importance is calorie restriction because that's been proven to reduce the uh, oxidative stress, allow you to live longer, allow the cells to live longer. And that's true. I actually, as a scientist and the head of the Department of Anti-Aging Medicine, did fasting on rats. And it, they did. They lived longer. In fact, they live longer, but the rats that lived the longest were the ones who had an open environment. Normally, they're kept in little cages like this with some food pellets on top, a water bottle going through, and that's it. Terrible conditions. But I had a gigantic room, maybe five times the size of this, and I just, I made it very creative. I would hide their food every day, so they had to find it. And that's created, created what is, we know call a, an enhanced environment. You want to enhance a person's environment. Why shouldn't we have an enhanced environment? Why should we get used to the same staid, boring routines, the same, the same type of living space, the rituals of everyday life. Why can't we break out of that? We can. It's something we choose not to do. I'll discuss that. But also, you should be taking NAD, L-carnosine, PQQ, the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, pycnogenol. These are the nutrients known to really help slow down the aging process and give your mitochondria new energy and also to help your heart, like coenzyme Q10 helps your heart, helps your brain. So we do that. Then we exercise. Right now, an hour and a half every day out on the road, then another hour in the gym, two and a half hours a day for senior citizens. But we just didn't start. We do, went very gradually, a little by little, not rushing it. Same way with juicing. Juicing, starting up, then building a plateau, bring it down, back up. But we're flooding our body with phytonutrients and the kind of enzymes that the average American is completely uh, without. And as a result, they're running multiple nutritional deficiencies. We have no nutritional deficiencies here. So in fact, people who came who had 3% bone in their body now have five. Some have eight. I mean, really grain, gaining strength in your bones, helping prevent osteoporosis, but also your, your, your immune cells, including stem cells, are in your bone. The stronger your bones, the more, more nutrient-rich your bones are with minerals, the younger you're going to be. And you can also support then more weight in lifting greater muscles. So all that we're doing, plus nature, outside these doors, there's dozens and dozens of acres of just pure natural beauty. You'll see 70 foot high magnolia trees and oak trees that are, we have no idea how old they are, but they're very big. So they're probably hundreds of years old, pines. So every day we're outside around seven hours now and it's very hot out. So it's nice to get that sun and create that vitamin D. All that is real, but none of that will matter if we don't unclutter our lives. It will not matter. It'll matter here because you're not cluttered here. But when you go home, think of all the things that you have that you've put, put into your life that really don't serve you at this time, even though at one time it may have been important to you. So why do we clutter? And what do we clutter with? Well, every person's different. There is a person I saw in one of the films last night. I did a lecture in New Jersey on Wake Up and Get Healthy. That was the title of the film. And if you want to see that, you'll see thousands of people in the audience. It was a massive group of people. We had to do a five-camera shoot just to cover the whole experience. It was about, an, I, we edited it down to an hour and a half. But there was one person sitting in there and uh, that was a person that's got an extraordinarily personality, uh, extraordinary. She, uh, she's vivacious, she's creative, she has artistic uh, intent. She can look at something and give you a lot of different ideas of how it can be repurposed and redone. And she's a good conversationalist. She knows a lot about human nature. And that's all true. Then you ask, how are you feeling? And privately, she will say, not so good. Why? Chronic depression, uh, feelings, of, uh, feelings of emptiness. Now, 
No one ever goes to her house. She says, I haven't had a person in my house in 20 years. Why? Too much stuff. What's that mean? That's kind of a mean, meaningless term to me. So one day, while attending a health support group, the theme was unclutter your life. And I said, how many people in here clutter, have more stuff than what they need? And about half the hands went up. And I said, well, who would like to start by an example of how easy it is to unclutter? Easy. How long have you been working on it? Well, two years, three years, six months. I said, no. You can unclutter anything in your life in under 24 hours. Complete. Done. Finished. Not possible. Of course it's possible. The difference is, do you want to do it in a quantum way, just do it, or do you want to do it piecemeal, a little bit at a time? Like this is like, imagine walking a marathon like this. All right? So what you do when you say it's going to take time, immediately that's a red flag. That means this, it's really never going to happen. I'll only do that which is necessary to appease any guilt or shame for not doing it, but don't ask me to do it all because I can't. I'm too attached and identified with what I have. So a woman says, I'll volunteer. And I said, okay. And I said, who would like to help her? Several people were there and uh, said, yeah, we'll help. All right. And indeed, that night they went out there. But one of the other people, one of the persons who had talked to me before the lecture, I said, who would like to help this woman unclutter her place? And you could just see her body go out. Like, I mean, just, she probably, her anus just shrunk to nothing. <laughs> I, you could see the tightness. And uh, so one person said, I'll help. Okay. That's all it was. Now, the next night, for those who were in this, I asked them, let's convene and discuss what that experience was like. How did you feel when you saw your stuff? Did you try to fight that? Did you suddenly have a reason not to throw away stuff because you suddenly accounted for memories for it and what, no, I don't want to give that up, I don't want to give that up. Next thing you know, you're giving nothing up. For everything someone puts in a box, you're taking it back out again. Even though it has no real value, you've created an illusion that you can't get rid of it. All right. So the four people came back the next day uh, to my office and we were sitting there and I said, how'd it go? The woman said, it was phenomenal. Uh, I just, I didn't believe that I could do it because I haven't been able to do it. And if I did get rid of something, I got something else to take its place. So it was always cluttered. All right. What do you feel now? She said, I feel totally exposed and totally vulnerable. I don't feel good. I said, why not? Because I live a rather chaotic emotional life. And when your emotions can fluctuate all over the place, uh, you're the only one who has control over it. You don't want people coming in to your, your, your environment and seeing how disorganized you are in your thoughts and your actions. Outside, you can put on a facade. You can act like the coolest person out there. Let someone come in and they suddenly see behind the curtain. Okay. But are you now, and I, then I went on to talk about what they could do the next day to rebalance themselves. The other person was very angry. And the woman who helped her said every step of the way she was fighting it. And the rule was you have three boxes, one box of clothes for the winter, one for the summer, and one for personal belongings. Uh, computers, cell phones, toiletries, anything you want in that hair dryer. And this does not include food, things, things like that, or utensils, but everything else you give away or you use or you throw away. It's got to be one of those three. And the woman said, I bagged more than 200 bags, big leaf bags of garbage to take out of her place. And then I turned to that woman, the woman I just noticed last night in the film, and I said, and how do you feel? She said, I feel depressed because that was my secret place that I could go and, and cut myself. Cut yourself, what do you mean? And she had a skirt on, and it was down about here, and she lifted it to here, and there were like every single square inch of skin had been cut. Have you ever heard of the cutters? Yeah. And, and she said, now, 
I don't know what to do. And part of the reason is that a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people, they, they present their story of woe. It's their story. And the first thing they try to do is get you to have empathy or compassion for their suffering so that, on the one hand, you never expect anything from a person that feels like a victim because they make sure that you know how emotionally traumatized they are by whatever's happened, no matter how long ago it was, and that that's their new persona. So anyone they're around, they're around to reaffirm their right to suffer. Now think of that. And the persons who come into their life are there to rescue them. Well, it's a natural inclination, a lot of men and women, to try to help people who are down, right? You want to help someone. That's just normal. We all have elements of empathy, whether we exercise it or not. We know when someone's suffering. But then the question is, are they self-inducing their suffering? Are they reaffirming their suffering? Are they doubling down on the emotions of suffering? Are they, are they willing to get out of that mindset? If they are, then they have to do it. They can't think about it because all their emotions are already preconditioned from the epigenic subconscious to defend anything, clutter, hoarding, um, self-abuse, low self-esteem. You keep having to hear yourself a thousand times tell you why you're not good enough, you shouldn't try, you're going to fail, you're going to be judged, possibly because of something that was put into your psyche years and years ago. But we have developed a whole culture of service, servicing people's dysfunction. And we have nothing out there to service people's functioning. Now think of that for a moment. For all the people who are healthy and happy, we offer them nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. In fact, we don't want to hear it. You start to see people kind of back up from them when you talk about how healthy they are. Well, no second. Uh, that's not, it ain't cool being that healthy. You know, that's not, that can't be right. Happy? You're that happy? Nobody can be happy like that. Certainly not consistently. Have you ever noticed that you, you don't really have much of an audience when you're talking about how your life works? But boy, you have legions of fans when you show your dysfunction. Well, how, how, how are you supposed to help yourself if you've identified with everyone else that's also suffering so you're vibrating that common energy of victimization? I'm a better person because I suffer. No, you're not. I'm a more worthy person. No, you're not. Because here's what you see, and I found this last night in an old, old lecture, almost 40 years old. I was talking about suffering. And there's someone pleading, right? And all these people are reaching out to help them. This was one of the B-roll captions I had in the film. And as everyone's reaching out, they didn't see behind the person they had a knife. Okay? Because frequently, the person who's demanding help, drawing attention to themselves, they don't want to change. That's their game. They mastered suffering. Now, there are people who haven't mastered suffering because they've suffered and they've been victims. And I'm not talking about people like the victims of the Holocaust or people who've been really abused. I'm talking about people who had a chance in life to get some help, get counseling, to try to understand perspective. If you stay in a victim mindset, then everything in life has to be filtered as a victim. You have to see everything as a victim. You're not going to have the joy. You're not going to have the exuberance, the passion, the pleasures of life. Because part of you feels, how can I enjoy this? If you suffered like I did, if you were traumatized, if you were abused, if you were lied to, if you were manipulated like I was, you wouldn't find any fun in life. So guess what kind of person they end up being with? What kind of person? Either an enabler or someone who suffers like them and they share a common Suffering martyrdom. Now, now we, huh? Codependent. Codependency. And <clears throat> therefore, then they have these extremely emotionally intense relationships. They're very volatile. So I said, be very careful, the person that wants you to rescue them, until they can prove that they have something worth living for and they deserve your energy. Just the assumption that everybody suffered will be helped and they'll change their life. Well, that's not the case. But nowhere do we ever help the people who are actually helping themselves. This is just a unique phenomenon in our society. If you're happy, healthy, constructive, a part of the social contract, if you're doing good, 
You're like an alien. It's like being a vegan. Right? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's not shaming the victim. That's merely identifying that before we suddenly codify what a victim is, who a victim is, and what the medical, because now it's been pathologized, so you can be medicated. Ah, antidepressants, antipsychotic medication, electroconvulsive therapy, institutionalization. Have, do you have a single record of a single person who had advanced depression or anxiety who overcame it using the traditional or accepted mental health model? If you have, let me know, because I haven't seen it. Yet I've seen a lot of people overcome their depression and anxiety with no medicines, just modifying their perception of themselves and changing their perception to change reality. How do I know? Because I've done two clinical studies. Out of the 44 clinical studies I've done, two have been on overcoming depression and anxiety through natural means. Everyone in that study, 500 people, that's all we had room for. Were any of you in that study, by the way? It was uh, three years ago from June until September in New York. We did it at a church uh, at 86 and Amsterdam, 86 and Weston Avenue. And you had to be diagnosed, medically diagnosed with clinical depression on meds to get in. At the end, we had a 93% success rate. No more meds. We didn't take them off. Their doctor, psychiatrist did. And they were considered normal. And then we followed them for another year. And they stayed normal and got healthier. Well, how's that possible? It's not possible in orthodox medicine or psychiatry or most of psychology that sides with psychiatry. But it is possible when you realize that every error that's happened to you in your life, if you're surviving today, like Viktor Frankl, the great survivor of five concentration camps, a phenomenal human being, what was his central meaning in his book and his themes after that? What did he tell the world? Who survived the concentration camps? Those who had something to live for, where they put another meaning in their life greater than their suffering and their imminent demise. Those are the people who are more likely to survive. Well, we have nothing, nothing in our society compared to the great genocides, the Armenian genocide and other genocides, the Rwandan genocide, and of course, the World War II concentration camp genocides. And yet, people suffer today and we're not giving them the tools to help them understand it's not as difficult as they would believe to change. But if they're only using the tools they have or what others have encouraged them, then they're going to stay in this circle, just running in circles. Interesting because I did a follow-up. Six months later, the person who had cluttered went back to clutter. And then I said, well, what was in there? All things like two-year-old newspapers from the floor to the ceiling. In fact, there was only one little narrow place to walk through, mm -hmm. and that led into the kitchen, and half her bed she had, but the other half was to the ceiling with everything. She'd like have 30 of something when she only needed one. Everything was clutter. Well, when you have that kind of clutter, you have any kind of clutter in your life, that's an opportunity to reassess your life. What are you valuing? What is the central meaning of your life? And more often than not, people who carry forward their pain from the past, and, and I'm not suggesting that their, their original pain was not legitimate. You know, people are traumatized, abused, sexually assaulted, lied to, manipulated, trusts are broken, even within families. Those are legitimate reasons to feel overwhelmed. But I believe what we need is we need a completely new mental dynamic of how we help people who are suffering. Because if all you're doing is just being empathetic with their suffering and you're not showing them with examples of how they can change that perception and therefore no longer suffer, you've got to get them to write a new story. Because right now, if they were in a room like this, if they were here for a week with you, every person in this room would know everything about their story. Every conversation they'd have would be always coming back to themselves because that's what people do. They bring your energy from where you're at down to their energy and then you live with that energy, and then you just walk around feeling drained. And Because how do you feel when you're around angry, depressed, or negative people? Energized or drained? Fatigue. Yes, fatigue. How do you feel when you're around happy people, positive, upbeat? Energized. 
energized. Energy is exchanged. It's, it's a real phenomenon. And that's why we say people have good vibrations. That's good energy. When we see someone that we feel strongly about, it's an energy that's exchanged. And this is real. This is all part of the whole science of energy medicine, energy healing, like Qigong and Tai Chi and all the other Oriental and Ayurvedic and nat native uh, cultures all have some form of energy healing, like the shaman, that's all energy healing. So what we have to do is first we have to see, is someone going to cooperate with us if we're helping them? If every time we go to help they're resisting, then you have to stop and say, if you want my help, show that you're going to use it because it's my time I'm giving you. I could do something else with my time, and that our time is the one thing we cannot repeat. You got this day once, this hour once, this minute once in your life. You'll never be as young as you are today. And we don't appreciate how many days, hours, months, years we've wasted chasing redemption through sacrifice, redemption through over-responsibilities. So we're responsible for things we shouldn't have been responsible for, things we should have given up. But part of, our, part of our conditioning is you've got to keep juggling these balls even when the balls are empty, when they serve no purpose at all. Keep those responsibilities going because we always knew you were a very responsible person, therefore we're judging you, valuing you, or disvaluing you based upon how many responsibilities you have. If you're the first at work and the last to leave, if you sacrifice your own time and quality of life where you've lost all balance, but as long as you're committed to being overly responsible, everybody will say, that's a very good person. <clears throat> no, that's an imbalanced person. You're not helping a person that overachieves, overworks, overanalyzes, overthinks, overdoes, because they've tipped. So now they don't have time for hobbies, friends, relationship. They don't have time for personal hygiene or personal health or personal awareness or growing their intellect or doing something creative or just being exuberant. They have no time for that. They're all those balls, all day long, juggle, juggle. So there's a time where if we want to help people unclutter, we have to realize they just have more balls in the air than we do. And then when you stop all the balls and pick them up and shake them, there's nothing in this ball. Well, it must be some value. Well, no, look at any of these hoarders. There's no value in any of this stuff they're keeping. So understand something. You've got to live your life as if it's starting all over today and it died yesterday. Because when you do that, when you start your life ev over every morning, then that day becomes one that you can put into that day anything you want. Because you're ruling the day. If you take that mind of the clutter in, then you're taking someone who has anchored themselves in identifying with that which is meaningless to their existence and completely so far existential, there's no benefit to it, except they have a perception that they need that. Why do you need it? Why do you need all the clothes you have? Why do you need, why do you need to have so many people in your life? Why do you need all these friends on the internet who are not friends and likes that don't like? It's all superficial. And now we have the worst of all of this from the past into new generations who think that's normal. So there's an old saying, those who travel far should travel light. So what can we do to lighten up our load in life? First and foremost, know what your life is supposed to be about. Have a central meaning. Honor that meaning. Then develop the skills and disciplines, the tools and the support system to help you get through that. If we all need help, and we all do at different times in our life, shouldn't we allow those people in our life that are there to really strengthen our bond with our own new reality and help us achieve that as we should for them. That's a healthy vibration. That's in getting into a, a rhythm of life with other people where there's very little conversation because there's no need to. Do you ever notice the people who are most less likely to do anything with what you say are the people who have the most to say? They never shut up. Everything is about them and it all comes back to them. That should be a red flag. So you can say to someone, hold on a second. Every time I see you, I will do so if only you never repeat anything again about you and your problems. Because I'm not your analyst. If you need an analyst, by all means get one. There are a lot of good ones out there. But our friendship, our relationship should not be about me 
constantly trying to provide some positive energy, positive enthusiasm, positive ideas to where you keep batting them all away because they don't fit into that cycle of who you are. So what we should do is make a list of all the things in your life you're willing to get, get rid of. Give it up, give it, use it, or throw it away. And then make a list and see what's on that list. Then how many people do you have in your life and what role are they there for? What, what, how do they serve you or you them? And if it's not mutual, then that's a person you have to be able to say goodbye to. Without blame, without guilt, without shame, you just let go of that energy. How many things are in your home or apartment that you don't need? And what does that do? It displaces balance. It displaces the feng shui. Clutter people never have a smooth feng shui, the flow of energy into an environment. Today, we were out looking at removing some hedges because it blocks the feng shui of how everything should be like a park and suddenly you got all this clutter there. So we're removing the clutter. Now the feng shui, the energy, will be more hospitable. And then that gives people an opportunity to sit out there and over, overlook the lake, where before it wouldn't be there. So remember, when you're uncluttering your life, look at what new scene you're going to have there. What will you see if the clutter is gone? You can't see through the clutter. All you see is the clutter, and then you go into crisis and drama. Your drama is, I've got all this stuff. I've got too many responsibilities. Well, what if your responsibilities become clutter, emotional clutter? What if engaging in other people's life and engaging in their dramas become a part of your drama? But you think you're being responsible because you've got a friend that's in drama. Okay, good. We all do. But set a position where you're going to help them, providing that they respect the help and energy you're giving them. Because there's nothing worse than someone saying they need help, you give help, and then the next day they don't do it, and they keep going. How many times, what is the magic number for you to continue to help people when everything you do, they resist? What's the magic number? How many times should you continue to engage in this? One time. Now that makes American psychologists, therapists, behavioralists, psychiatrists, physicians, family members, head burst because they live these artificial, stupid, vile, condescending, hypocritical agendas by living through someone else as if someone else is going to change when there's no example of that person changing it. You continue to sacrifice your emotions, your energy, your time, and imbalance yourself in the process trying to help them. In fact, there was four people who were supposed to be here during our, our long clinical study. All of them had the same reason not to be here because personal family dramas and crisis prevented them from being here. All four of these people at one time were healthy people. One of them was a national champion athlete. And all four weren't here because the people they were supposed to be helping refused their help and they felt guilt and shame. So they kept, and one's 10 years now, another seven years, another seven years, another six years. So I asked him, okay, fine. Here, at least, you could regain some sense of balance, understand some issues. What are you going to do every day when all you're doing is engaging in the arguments and the contentious moments, and no one's taking your advice? You've already spent seven to ten years of your own life wasted. And they acknowledge that. It's like a wasteland. And you can't get it back, all because you were bounded by guilt and shame, insecurity and fear. Well, what if you didn't have that? What if you just simply, today, do not try to motivate me. Do not, by guilt or shame, it isn't going to work. If you want my help, I'm there to help you. Absolutely. Now prove you deserve my help. Prove you're willing to change something. What the hell are you going to change? All right? If they say nothing, I just want you to always be here and me to complain about what life is for me, the victim, but I'm not going to change anything. And that's most people. Look around, oh, the obesity in America, the diabetes in America, the heart disease in America, all these things. Do you think these are by accident? Do you think these are happy people? Do you think these people have balanced their life? Do you think these people were living through their spiritual awareness? No. If you did, you wouldn't abuse yourself. This is abuse. Intentional neglect equals abuse. So when you are so confused about not having an an adequate purpose or meaning. You're living through other people's purpose and meaning. It no longer fits. You've grown out of it. 
then isn't, shouldn't you have the opportunity to change? Now, if you need support for that, good. Then show that you're willing to change. Even when people come to a place like this, the easy lesson is drink your juices, eat your vegetarian food, and take your supplements, go exercise. That's easy. But also, we all know, everyone in this room, if we didn't have 50 lectures on behavior modification, none of this would have meant anything to you. Am I right or wrong? And it's only now some of you are coming to this awareness of how powerful your ego and defense mechanisms are in preventing you from being honest about your own self. We just haven't been honest about anything in America. We lie about everything. We deny everything. Now, challenge me. Show me I'm wrong. Right now, please. Show me I'm wrong. I'm willing to hear any challenge to what I just said. Okay, let's break it down. I'll make it easy for you. During 2008 and through 2012, when 7 million Americans were thrown out of their homes, excuse me, 7 million homes were foreclosed on, let's go easy, one child per family, that's 21 million people were made homeless, we would only report on those people who were homeless who were in shelters. So we didn't look at 21 million people homeless, we looked at only those who showed up in shelters. Most were couch surfing in you know, family members' basements and rec rooms or garages. In fact, I'll give you a story. Down in Florida where I live, I was driving one Saturday down a street, just a regular street, and I noticed there were a lot of cars. I mean, like four or five cars per house. These are small houses, like 1,200, 1,500 square feet, working class houses. So I got to the end of the road and I turned around and came back up. And I parked my car and I went across and there were some guys outside this garage, and I said, fellas, I said, I'm your neighbor, I don't live far from here. This isn't Sunday. If this was Sunday and everybody was here to watch the ball game, okay, I get that. This is Saturday, and it's Saturday afternoon. What's everyone here for? The guy said, you work for the city? I said, no, I don't work for the city. I said, okay. And he opened up the garage door, and here they were making a living space for his brother and his brother's wife and kid in his garage. He said, everyone here, has got family members or friends that are down their luck, so we're accommodating. I said, well, first, I think that's very noble. I said, good for you for knowing that you're there to support someone else who cannot at this moment support themselves. He said, well, he said, it's a hassle because I got my own kids. And so we had to bring everything outside, my wife's car and my truck. <clears throat> now their cars, we're just afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? Well, because these are single family residences. And this town loves to fine you for anything that breaks a code. He's right. That's where people have been. A friend of mine who's a medical doctor, after going through three divorces, had no money to keep his office open and was living in one of his patients' basement for a year. When I found out about it, I helped him. But I said, you realize how you got here? You thought you were smarter than the choices you made. Now learn some lessons. And we had a long talk that day. We drove from Manhattan up to Grossinger's Hotel, which is about two, hour, two and a half hour drive, and then just to talk and back. And he, he, he came clean, yeah. yeah he, he made a lot of bad choices through his ego. And he never thought, you know, since business was going up, that suddenly everything would go down. Well, how about right now? 33 million Americans unemployed as of today. More unemployed today than during the Great Depression in 1933, when 24.9% of Americans were out of work. That doesn't even include the shadow statistics. Those who stop looking, those who are no longer on unemployment because they don't get any payment. So we can't even be honest about how many are unemployed. It's about 40% or between 30 and 35% uh, unofficially and probably closer to 20% officially, but these figures are gonna vary. And we're not done with this yet because you can't flip on the lights and suddenly everybody goes back to work. A lot of those jobs are not gonna be there and there's gonna be unrest. And right now we're guesstimating about one third of the American population are food insecure. There's never been a time in American history so many Americans were hungry, skipping meals, not having enough to feed their children, and the government has done zero to prevent this or ameliorate it. So, there's going to be 
a lot of lessons learned, and these are all unfortunately painful lessons. Nobody wants to see someone suffer like this. So imagine that you're not suffering because of that. You're suffering because of every opportunity you're given to change your story, to change your perception, to realize, yes, all of us have been abused at different times, a different level, a different way. Not always as, as, as severe, but we can either choose to stay a victim or change. Become a person who understands the power of forgiveness, the power of reclaiming an authentic life and going forward. And it starts with uncluttering. Uncluttering. Get rid of it. Because when you're getting rid of it, all those memories from so many things that we insulate ourselves, the more we collect, the more we insulate ourselves emotionally. So we've made that which is insignificant completely significant and identify our life. So let's start with a blank page and be the architect of the life we want to live from here forward. Who do we want as friends? What type of friends? What kind of relationship do we want? Where do we want to live? Why would we live there? What sacrifice would we make if we stay where we're at versus what sacrifice if we go someplace? What tools do we need in order to change? We have to humble our ego so we can ask for help where it's needed instead of thinking we can do it all on our own. Nobody does it all on their own. There's too much interrelationship of ideas. If you read a book, let's say a, a book by uh, Eric Fromm, and you decide there's important messages and you begin to change your life, well, then Eric Fromm was a part of changing your life. Right? If you see someone who's 100 years old on the internet, and this just happened a couple months ago, running in a national championship race, and I've been in those races with her, meaning we applauded her. Every, every one of the if there are 10,000 athletes, we all stood up and applauded her. Then she sets an example for other people. If she could do it, why can't I do it? Well, the idea is you can. And sometimes you need someone <clears throat> who has repurposed their life. So why don't you repurpose your life by reorganizing your life, by uncluttering your life, and asking, is there really any value, real value to you, by all the stuff that you have? And can you put everything into three large boxes? Clothing, personal items that you need, and then all your toiletries and everything that you would use in a place that does not include food. And then say, okay, how do I start? And then start over realizing you're more important than your possessions. You're more important than your clutter. You're more important than your pain. You're more important than your suffering. You're more important than your trauma. You're more important than your crisis. You're more important than the abuse that has occurred to you in your life. No one's denying your abuse. No one's denying your pain. No one's denying your suffering. But not today. You've done it. How many times do you have to keep reliving that, as bad as the initial problem was, every time you reposition it in your brain, you recreate it. And that depresses your immune system. It turns your DNA into an off position. So you have the control now. Then you didn't. We don't all have control over the circumstances in our life. But today, no one's abusing us. Today, no one is violating us. Today, we have control over the choices we want. We have a control over our perceptions. I can't change everything out there, but I can change how I'm going to view it. So I'm going to stay non-toxic in a toxic environment. I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay austere in a cluttered environment. I'm going to stay positive in a negative environment until I can change the circumstances. So we can't all leave here and go back to perfect environments. There are no such things. But what we can do is decide where we don't want to be and why and have the courage to change. And there's going to be conflict because not everybody's going to appreciate the changes you want to go through. Then you have to ask, is this person a part of the problem or a part of your solution? Because at this point in our lives, you have to decide if you're going to take the next step in your life alone or with people who are there to truly support you and not out of fear, not out of emptiness, not out of insecurity because that's a person not helping you because they're going to make you feel guilt and shame for changing what you once had, if you really had that. That includes friends. What are you moving for? What are you going up to Oregon? Why are you going to Nova Scotia? Why are you going, why are you going, why are you going to France? No matter what you say, they're not going to understand because they've already filtered all elements that would allow them to make positive change in a timely manner. They'll wait for the crisis, and then after the crisis impacts them, then they'll look for someone to blame. 
That's just one more reason why they suffer. Everything. Who knew it was going to be a fire up and who knew that we we're going to have a tornado? Who knew we were going to have a Hurricane 5 you know, uh, down in Florida? Anybody who wanted to. It wasn't a secret. Did you not hear me predict two and a half years ago that when 7 million people fled Florida because of a hurricane that was Category 4, but it was only 2 mile an hour under Category 4, that the first time we have another Category 5 or even 6, because a Category 6 happened for the first time this year with outer band winds of 224 miles an hour over the Bahamas, could you imagine what will happen to Florida? It will be abandoned by all the people who are snowbirds or have a second home in another environment, generally a northern environment. And that will absolutely collapse the entire real estate market. It'll go to nothing. That means local municipalities will not have the funds to support all their programs. There'll be massive cuts in every service. And that will open it up to gangs, which are down there now. In fact, after, right after the hurricane, I mean immediately after the hurricane passed two and a half years ago, on my street, which is three miles long, there are, must have been 40 trucks so you look first and you thought, well, I thought all the neighbors left. Because when I drove up to ask any of my neighbors, do you have anything you want me to store? I've got a walk-in refrigerator and I've got, got a compressor. I've got, you know, I've got a generator. I've got you know, food. Happy to share it with you, as I always do after a storm or something. All, all the houses were empty. These are people coming to steal everything they could in the house. When they came around the back of my house, I was standing at the gate and I said, Get out of your car, you're in trouble, your truck. Oh, we just want to know you came to steal because I've been watching all this stealing. The police couldn't come because they were overwhelmed trying to help the people whose homes were flooded. Mind you, this is within 24 hours. Homes were flooded, uh, debris was everywhere, power lines were down, no electricity, no water, no air conditioning. And uh, across the street, right across the street was a couple and they're sitting outside in lawn chairs. They're an older couple. So I walked over there later and I said, um, how are you doing? They're, well, it's unfortunate. We're just watching all day long. All of our neighbors get everything stolen. Okay. That's unfortunate. Because they knew, I think it was a woman who says, we try calling police and nothing. They got more important things. What do you think is going to happen when society begins to abandon its social virtues and its community out efforts. You're going to have green zones, places you can live and be protected, but every place else, it's like being in a Mad Max film. That's coming right now, right now, because of the coronavirus. You can't have 100 million Americans who are food insecure, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who don't have the food to feed their kids, and expect those people not to be concerned. So once again, what we do, we're living in the wrong places. We're living by the wrong stories. We're living through our emotions. We're living through our constraints and restraints. We're living through our resistance to authentic change. We give an excuse for everything. It's always emotional this, trauma that, crisis that, crisis that. So we say we can't do anything because we're in crisis. Well, you're in crisis because that's the central meaning of your life. And when I asked one of the people who was supposed to be here, I said, so let me get this straight. In order to provide enough money to keep your mom where she's at, you had to work night shifts in an environment where you were getting hit with electromagnetic pulses at an astronomical level because of the work she was doing. Each one of those could take up to 10 years off your life. For what? A mother that's not going to change a single thing. Yeah, well, that's some sacrifice you just made. You sacrifice both people. Your mom's not going to change, and you, you didn't change, and as a result, you've lost 20 years out of your life. True story. Okay, that's our lesson.